Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. One of the things that we need in society are people who really know about what we're doing in government and in the great city. Well, there's one individual who's distinguished himself as a true public intellectual. Now, we don't have that tradition of public intellectuals here in Hawaii, so when I find a true public intellectual, I'm delighted. This is somebody who takes the research of academia and applies it to the real world. Now, not everybody likes to have public intellectuals. One named Socrates found himself put to death for speaking out against the establishment. Well, I hope that doesn't happen to this dear friend, but he's doing quite a bit of good for Hawaii by addressing issues far and wide that matter in the daily life of our city, of our government, and I'm delighted to introduce him today. His name is Panos Primaduras. He is the chairman and a professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Hawaii. He ran twice for mayor of Honolulu, garnering a good following, but didn't quite make it. Yet his views are well known. I'm delighted today to have Panos on the show. Panos, welcome back. Kelly, good to be here. Thank well, you very much. always good to talk with you. You know, you're a prolific guy. Yeah, I try my best. I have uh, lots of people to educate, including my own students. So, For a moment, I thought we could call today's program from A to Z with Pons Z Yeah, but we would need 24 hours. We, but, uh, we talk yeah. about everything from APEC to the Honolulu Zoo. Zoo. Yeah, we can cover that. <laughs> but you know, most of the people who are watching who live here in Hawaii know mm -hmm. what we're going to talk about first, and that is the problem of congestion. Sure. I remember when I took my kids to Disneyland in Los Angeles. I was thinking, oh, this is terrible. It's got to be the worst traffic in the nation. Mm -hmm. But uh, you've pointed out that that may not be so. Well, I in some respects, uh, Honolulu has works worse statistics than Los Angeles. You're kidding. Los Angeles still, and Washington, D.C., and New York, they have terrible, terrible congestion, debilitating congestion. But in Honolulu, our congestion is explosive. There is one thing that is called the travel time index, All right. TTI which measures from a base of travel time how much more it ratchets as it gets more congested. So if you are in LA, let's say your travel time to do just a simple trip is 10 minutes, during the worst time of the day is 30 minutes. They have a TTI of three. Okay, you go from 10 minutes to 30 to minutes, all right. Exactly. The similar trip in Hawaii, it goes from TTI three to TTI-5. My goodness. That's how many times we get a top ranking because our short trips become very immobilizing because they take forever. And a good example of that, for example, is the middle street and the H1, H2 merge. There you go. Where mm -hmm. you can lose five, ten minutes, just try to move one critical right. half a mile. Or whether you're trying to go out to IAEA from central Honolulu at the right. end of the day. Right. Now, everybody feels that, but mm -hmm. let me ask you again. We're ranked number one in the nation for that kind of congestion? Yes. Uh, the only good thing about <laughs> this is that uh, our trips tend to be shorter. Well, the other good, so, thing, uh, about you know, it, the other good thing about it is it's a hostage uh, audience for those of us who broadcast on radio. I guess so. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a strong radio market. You're right. So You're right. congestion, that word we use in many settings. We use it when our chests are all tight mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. forth. Well, what does it mean in terms of a city and in terms of uh, traffic? Well, it means really for a city that essentially is tasked as a government, the government of the city or the state, to provide capacity, they're providing insufficient capacity. This is a problem that Honolulu has for years. It's not really unique to Honolulu. Island communities really don't tend to have too much roadway infrastructure because they were building they were built around fishing villages etc there's a whole history of that sure now it's but honolulu grew big you yes. know uh, tourism is uh, our number one thing so you know mobility is very significant for us we're not a quiet greek, greek island right. uh, this is a mega city with you know seven million tourists a year we have to play the game the way it is being played uh, correctly which is not the way it's being played right now because right now we're plagued with sure. congestion, we have not upgraded our infrastructure to match the needs of the people in the economy. Well, it sounds like th there's a little bit of supply and demand at work in the causes of congestion. That's the basic game, yes. We have game, the yes. demand for more capacity to move from place to place, the demand with more cars, yet the supply I is not growing along with that demand. Right. A and that comes, you know, from, from almost the weird, I would say, local mindset 
uh, because we are developing far away places, Kapolei Lake comes to mind, and everybody is okay with it, meaning that we're gonna have Kapolei, Lake, it's gonna have its local streets, its city hall, its schools, its electricity, its churches, its parks, no new roads to connect to Kapolei. Now, what I like about the way you look at things is, is you don't just see one thing, like a form of transportation right. or roads or cars. You're thinking about an entire system. And when That's you right. talk about this quote-unquote weird local mindset, it sounds as though we're not thinking about the entire system. We're not thinking about how, for example, the vision of creating the second city of Kapolei can impact traffic out in East Oahu. Right. And not only that, we actually made the tremendous mistake that essentially we wedged all these folks in Kapolei in front of the poor Waianae folks. That, that, that really what upsets me, because those folks traditionally had a very long commute to town, but now we are stuffing a lot of people in front of them, so their travel time is doubling, and they didn't do anything wrong. Do you wrong. think it could be that those poor Waianae folk, as you put that, don't have the same political clout as those oh, who are certainly. responsible for Second City. Certainly, certainly. So, so we've got supply and demand, we've got bad planning, we've got limited vision that doesn't see the system, we've got politics, we have all of that. Let's just take for a moment while we put our discussion of congestion on the side mm -hmm. for a moment. Uh, let's have a quick talk about Kapolei. Mm. Uh, it recently celebrated the 15th year. Right. Uh, the second city coming to fruition. There was mm -hmm. a lot of fanfare uh, and so forth. But you see it a little differently. Right. I th in my opinion, Kapolei was a terrible mistake. In fact, uh, you've called it a planning disaster. It's a planning disaster. Uh, this is not the correct way for our city to have developed. What are some of the things that were wrong from a planning point of view when it came to Kapolei? Uh, the, the fact that it's, uh, you know, cookie-cutter suburban America. This is not, you know, a suburban America type of place. So it, it took it, a certain it, model and vision and that's right. planted it out there in West Oahu as, as if it were just going to turn into this great city. That's right. And actually, uh, the planners of the city that they really don't have significant power, they put the coefficients there for more dense development. But, you know, once the developers got the green uh, light, uh, they built suburban homes because they're much easier to build and they sell like hotcakes. So the market, although it was ignored in the first place, mm -hmm. the market takes over. The market takes over. A and, and it turns into being a bedroom community, another big Mililani, so mm -hmm. to speak. That's right. Rather than being this city. What are the elements that it takes to have a thriving city? It takes an economy. And, okay. and, 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 and Kapolei that, doesn't have an economy. You know, I, I'm kind of old-fashioned when it comes to economy. I think mm -hmm. economy has something to do with jobs. That's right. You got it. <laughs> You're saying that, that we, we built this city, we built the homes for the city, we built the stores for the people in the mm -hmm. homes, mm -hmm. but we didn't have industry out there That's right. producing jobs. Right, and, and uh, how we did it, we did it by force. Remember, 1995, Governor Cayetano actually built the only six-story building that still towers in Kapolei, That's right. and then he told half of his DOT folks, you are moving out. Well, Forget Punchbowl Street, you are out in Kapolei. That actually was, uh, you know, the forced move uh, had some negative impacts as well, because quite a few uh, right. of the more uh, mature, let's say, and experienced uh, DOT engineers, they were living in traditional neighborhoods between, you know, Manoa and Aina Haina. Now, if you lived in downtown Honolulu or Kaka'ako, you wouldn't balk at a six-story building. It'd be hardly right. noticeable because to be a city, we have to have taller buildings in a small, dense place. But if six stories is the limit, the or the virtual limit out there in Kapolei, mm -hmm. and we're not going to have taller buildings, are we really going to have the density needed to build an urban center? Well, unfortunately, the developers are not even developing at six story. Uh, they don't want to do them. They said the market is not there. So we have so, sh short buildings, right. bedroom community, right. no jobs. Right. Now, let me ask you this question. Doesn't government think about this when it's about to launch such a project? <laughs> um, well, um, the, 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 it was one of the huge uh, failings in forecasting. Uh, the, the, the similar failings are, you know, what they expect Kapolei to become, 100,000 people. I don't know how you can fit 100,000 people in all that uh, expanse there because there is no density. 
Of course, they can change 20, 30 years down the road. They can demolish you know, low density and go into high density. That's another way of throwing good money after bad money. Now, now you pointed out that the government was in control of this process mm -hmm. rather than the market forces themselves, where you have people working off of supply and demand. Now, it looks to me, as I l review the history of Honolulu, mm -hmm. That cities and urban areas tend to grow up naturally around little clusters, right? With the harbor, the downtown, right. where you have the banks and you have the tall buildings, and then roads ultimately connect these little clusters. Right. This was a You're planned development. It was a planned development for the second city, and it had a lot to do with making money. There you go. Follow the money. I mean, the couple A happened for the money, because you know sugar was not profitable. Now, when you talk about the money. What, what, where does that money lead us? Does that lead us to uh, cont contributors to politicians who, be, right. who gain the right to be developers? Right. Is that right. one of the... Right. I mean, I think uh, one of the big four was very heavily involved with that, the Campbell Estate. Uh -huh. Actually, the Campbell Estate wanted to do better things about Capole. Uh, it ran away from them uh, because then, you know, uh, the, the, the developers took over and uh, the city and their facilitating planners uh, they created to what now is typical suburbia with all the problem that come with it. Uh, as you said, uh, it is the second bedroom. It doesn't have an economy. And unfortunately now we're investing billions to give it a tether. Now what we're The rail yes. is actually a tether to the first city, Honolulu. So in other words, we incentivize the non-development of economy and jobs in Kapolei because they tell people, well, you take the rail and you take your jobs downtown. You stay a bedroom community. So the second city is never becoming a second city. Now, you're talking about accidents of planning, but it sounds to me there's also a nefarious purpose in this planning. Of course it is nefarious. It, it, makes, well, a it, it makes a pathway and a need for the rail. It is, because actually if they wanted successful rail, number one, they would have done light rail on the old Oahu and Land and Rail Company, ORL uh, Guideway, which they never even touched it. So you're suggesting that if we were really committed to an urban city out there in West Oahu, mm -hmm. it would have been more complete and self-sufficient, able to produce jobs, not that's requiring right. this tether, a so tether to speak, that's right. back to the urban center where the jobs are. In fact, that would have incentivized its sole survival. Would you have required that kind of thinking of your students? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and in fact, it's happening, you know, uh, because I see, and I'm very happy about the Colina development, uh, sprouting very nicely and creating quite a lot of jobs. So uh, that, in addition with then perhaps expansion in the industrial area, well, you've been so that yes. that can really create in the, the new shopping center that they are developing. So why do we need the ten billion dollar tether, right. which is you know a question perhaps for later on, but. One mistake leads to the next. You've been, That's the point. You've been a strong friend of the Grassroot Institute and sure. been a leader in providing a free market analysis. So isn't this a textbook case of where government central planning has made us very vulnerable to economic problems and has failed to meet the needs of people? That, that is the unfortunate part when, unfortunately, legislators, councils, mayors, or governors think that they know best and they can dictate the solutions. It's the worst. It's it's essentially what, in academia, we call it a solution looking for a problem. There you go. So, <laughs> just to bring our first segment to a close, then, sure. we go back to congestion. Mm -hmm. Very few people realize that this little project out there, Second City, was actually built to create congestion. So yes, that, exactly. So that it would pave the way for the rail project. It was part of their idea that eventually there would be a high capacity corridor, mm -hmm. but. At the time they designed it, they never realized of how useful cars are, how complex life is on Oahu, how many kids go to private school, and all the needs that they are all car-centric. Well, with that said, I'm going to ask you about the rail in the next segment. Looking forward <laughs> to it, I guess. My guest today, <laughs> Professor Panos Privadouris, a true public intellectual with ideas that are sometimes contrarian to the middle of the road, easygoing, politically correct way of thinking. But we need him. We need him in order to put a check on a lot of centrally controlled government that denies the powers of the open market. Uh, I'm Kaylee Akina with the Grassroot Institute on Think Tech's Ehana Kako will be right back. 
Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. Aloha, this is Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii. We talk about positive stories positive stories of businesses in Hawaii, how they have been successful, and how they have overcome some of the obstacles that a lot of us encounter when we try to have a business here. And believe it or not, there are a number of positive stories here, and we want to talk to all of you. So we broadcast live every Thursday at 2 o'clock, uh, and it rebroadcasts again on Olelo Channel 54. So I sure hope to see you next time. Please tune in on Thursdays at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. At the Grassroot Institute, we love to say Ehana Kako. It means let's work together. Think of the terrible alternative, not working together. We believe that it's important to bring people together to work for a better economy, government, and society. And one of those people who's been doing that for a long time here in the state, uh, I think he's a real treasure, is Professor Panos Provadouris. We were talking during the first segment about how a mistake in planning, in fact, a disaster in planning, the second city in Kapole, has lent to congestion and traffic across the entire island. But, of course, that ushered in the need for something to get us through all that congestion, which is the rail. Panos, so, you have been one of the chief critics right. of the rail. And I want to put a tough question to you right at the outset, mm -hmm. which is why in the world now at this stage that it's been passed by the city council, funded by the legislature, its construction has begun, much has been laid down already, mm -hmm. it's going through, the political will is there. Why are we still talking about the rail? Uh, well, it's, it's the elephant in the room. Uh, it, it is the biggest project we have done and we will likely ever do in Hawaii. Uh, unfortunately, it's going very poorly for us, so we have to keep talking about it because I if it was going right on time, right on money, right on cost, mm, then it would have been a done deal. Unfortunately, it has delays, uh, costs have uh, skyrocketed, the congestion from the construction of the project is becoming very difficult to handle. And uh, now the realization comes that, you know, that thing, first of all, looks quite ugly. And people realize that it's so fixed and so limited that even when they had the inclination to use it, they might use it, but not to the degree that would have made a difference. And these are the things that I've been saying for 10 years. There is nothing inherently bad about rail. You cannot be in Beijing and not have rail. Mm -hmm. Actually, Beijing, when I visited, it didn't have rail. And they are building fast lines now like crazy because, of course, if you're growing to 30 right. million people, mm -hmm. you have the density. There is no way you can transport these people in, by buses. In fact, as I've read what you've written and listened to what you've said, it would be a misnomer to say that you're against rail. That's right. Uh, in fact, it goes back to what we were talking about in the first segment. This all has to do with planning. It all has to do with the system that we see in the entire state and the entire city and county, particularly on this island. And as we were talking about Kapole as a second city and so mm -hmm. forth, if we make planning decisions that are in error, we, we can end up creating a need for something that's not there. But I think, haven't you said that had we planned urbanization correctly, correctly that's right. with, with a dense corridor perhaps between uh, downtown Salt Lake Honolulu, and downtown Salt Lake. your Waikiki to that's Salt right. Lake, that's right. And keep our dense development down there, it would have made sense to have a rail system, a fixed rail system there. Well, guess what? Uh, we, we got these lessons and they were out there for us to see completely free, completely obvious. It's called Singapore, it's called Taiwan, Taipei, it's called... Uh, um, Missed my thought. Uh, Hong Kong. That's right. Uh, it, it's called Malta. I mean, so we've got fixed rail within dense urban settings. That's right. We're not running the rail halfway across an island. W instead of using the valuable lessons from other overpopulated island communities, we're creating cookie character suburban developments like Hawaii Kai, Mililani, and Kapole. I mean, that is insanity for a place. And then, disingenuous politicians come back and they tell us 
we have to go back and produce our own food. Are you kidding me? When you have all this opportunity to protect all this land and make it your number one priority for agriculture and get at least one third of the food production here, you're the one who signed all the permits for the thousands of homes to be built out there in Mililani, Kapolei, and Hawaii Kai. Who are these people? It's the same party taking the same decisions and then coming back and say that, you know, they never even ac acknowledge that they did it wrong. So once again, we see lack of understanding of the complete system. That's right. If we really were committed to growing a larger agricultural base, we would have had prioritized that at the beginning and factored in the need for m developing more Preserving the land. Preserving rather exactly. than running rail through it. Exactly. And then if they really so enamored about rail, I'm telling you, uh, the original system that uh, Mayor Fassi was thinking about, Waikiki to the airport and perhaps Aloha Stadium, that was perhaps a reasonable 10-mile stretch, high density. And now, well, Mayor Fassi didn't have the foresight to see how big Kakago will get. But now, fast forward 20 years, look what happened to Kakago. What was the... So, density is there now. What was the or original price tag attached when rail was approved, and how does that compare to where it's gone and where it may be going? Um, well, where, it, where it's going, it's really it's going in the stratosphere. Uh, well, it started at $4.6 billion. Uh, that was the price uh, when, you know, uh, we had the vote for it, the infamous 2008 initiative. Uh, shall the city install a steel-on-steel fixed guideway system? So the price at the time was 4.6 billion. Well, little do you know, uh, immediately, you know, uh, Mufi jumps sh uh, ship, then Carlisle becomes mayor, he gives us the good news, it's 5.3 billion. Two years later, Caldwell is the mayor, he gives us the good news, it's 6.3 billion. But there are a lot of other tens of thousands of billions involved, or millions, so the total as we sit here today is somewhere close to seven and a half billion dollars with none of the stations built and almost half of the project not gone out to bid. So we're, we've doubled it. we doubled it. And we've only almost. got a portion. Now this is the interesting thing, Kelly and I published an article about this. Mm -hmm. 7.5 billion, even if it stays there, it's one half the cost of the infamous big dig. Mm. And that's a Boston of four to five million people with the feds behind it because a lot of that project was tunnels and highways where the feds pay 80 or 90 percent. Here we are stuck with a mega project with the feds say that you have to do it, but you know what? We only give you what Senator Rinoe told us, 1.55 billion. The rest of it, chop your neck, do bloodletting or whatever it takes in terms of uh, taxes, you have to pay through the nose you have to complete the system. And you have pointed out that we have not even begun to count the cost into the future. That's with right. With all of the contingencies that, that may be there. Let's yeah. just take a, a side track, a mm -hmm. little spur off yeah. the rail for a yeah. moment. You mentioned taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the more infamous ways of raising the, raising the price, uh, what we need for the rail, has been to extend our GET, our general yes, excise tax. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that this powerful form of taxation, a consumption tax mm -hmm. that has a multiplier effect, That's right. funds, oh, maybe 50, 55 percent of our state uh, coffers That's right. and so forth. So what went on here? How, how did the GE tax become the favored means of funding the rail overcharge? Well, because they thought that uh, at the time they were trying to do this, that they had a better chance at the legislature than they had at the city council. And they all remember the Rin Mancho affair in 1991, where that one vote uh, essentially killed the tax so the, scheme. So they get all they can from the city council. Right. And, and then to complete the project or to move it forward, they go mm -hmm. to the legislature. Yeah, they got oh, the money. Isn't there the something money. a little bit odd about the state having to, be, to pay for a county's decision? Well, the feds don't care. Mm -hmm. The feds care only for a reliable funding source. They don't even call taxation. Reliable funding source. Whatever you can find that is reliable. If you want to add it to your water bill, they're fine with them. You want to add it to the utility bill, they're fine with it. Just find something reliable that it's a tack on and it has a predictable path in the future to collect the amount uh, forecasted for construction. In other words, they don't want to bankroll a system that, you know, 
two years down the road, you completely run out of money. Everything is wasted, and the system is only 10% done, and then it just uh, collects weeds. No. So mm -hmm. that's why the GT was such right. a powerful tool, because it is the foundation of uh, tax collection in Hawaii. So it was very convincing. And do you think there's something psychological, too, to the fact that when we talk about increasing the GET, we're talking in tiny numbers in the right. public's mind. We're, we're saying we're going to go from 4.5% to 5 or 5% right. to 5 and a half hours. for That's a very short very period dangerous. of time. But, but yeah. that kind of masks the actual quantification. Those are very dangerous. I mean, it, it, it boggles the mind sometimes what simple things do to the understanding of people. People here locally, and, and internationally really, swallow billions like, you know, they're aspirin because, eh, well, the cost overrun is one billion dollars. Okay. Then UH has a little scandal there, the Wonder Blunder, $300,000. That sounds like such a big number. Thanos, that's lower than I'm, some UH I'm salaries. <laughs> it, la it lasted like six months. That's right. $300,000. UH doesn't know what is going on. Hard people come with $910 million that they banded to about a billion dollars. Well, one headline in the newspaper a month later, well, we'll have to do something about it and hush hush. But it's almost like you're suggesting that this is about sales and marketing. Oh, it, it's a complete sales dog. <laughs> I mean, kind a of, dog uh, and pony I show. Mean, uh, yeah, I mean, everybody who knows anything knows that, you know, at this day and age, uh, rail systems are uh, certifiable boondoggles, so it, it needed a Hanneman and all the, the, you know, the strength that you brought in the politics and the conniving and everything to uh, to ram it through. At this stage, what can be done? I know we're in a crucial month, March 2016, right. because we're at the the opening of the first or the completion the, of the first station. Not the completion, station. the starting actually. The starting. They, yeah. they broke ground for the first station. Uh, so at this point we're getting rail. I mean, there is not, mm -hmm. there is not. I, I don't know of anybody who is actually actively trying to stop rail. It, the project is happening, but it's happening at a very slow pace that lets us think maybe we should do something a little differently. What are some alternatives the we alternat have to the original The alternatives I, I, we put out there, and Dave Shapiro actually kind of stole my thunder, although I, in my analysis I had put it there, uh, to stop the rail at the airport or Middle Street and use the Middle Street transfer station uh, to uh, distribute people in town. In other words, the rail will be calamitous coming through Kalihi, downtown Kakako and Ala Moana. The useful part of the rail is to go serve the second city, expand towards Kolina and Waianae, and serve the entire community, connect to Kalihi, and stop it there. It's a longer suburban rail that is going to run quite fast. Once you bring it to town, it has a lot of tight turns, a lot of stations, it's going to slow down the whole system, so forget the urban part. It's four miles of hell that actually they're going to cost a billion each. So stop it at Middle Street and expand it westbound to serve actually the people that they need alternative transportation because of their long trips. Well, what's it going to take to have that kind of revision of the some kind of political intellect and uh, particularly leadership? Uh, yeah, leadership, particularly at uh, at Congress. Uh, of course, quite a few people will come on and say, oh, if you make any changes, uh, it invalidates our agreements and all. And you know, if you look at the fine print, that is basically correct. However, trains are political systems. If you have focused congressional representation, you can talk to FTA and you can change things about a system that it's only about 15% done. With the experience we have now and the way we see it developing, Let's develop it and make it better. So you're saying that there's another system people need to see, that what happens in congestion here in Honolulu no. has something to do with who you elect to Congress. The, very much so. Very much so. Th those are our people that they actually can, they actually control the budget. FT FTA uh, lives and dies based on the budget that is controlled very at Congress. Good. So that is very significant. Their contributions are very significant there. When we come back from a break, I'm going to ask sure. you this question. What would you do if you assigned a student the task of designing a choo-choo train on <laughs> rails, and he turned it in as an engineer, but didn't have a power supply? Okay. Okay. That's my, a fun question. My guest, Panos Privadouris, will be back for our closing segment when we talk about energy and the environment right after this message. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope that you will tune in and watch the show. It is 
inspiring and uplifting and educational also. We talk with artists of all different ilk. We talk with them about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, most dear to my heart, why they do it. And it, it never ceases to be fascinating when you get the answer to that question. I hope you'll join us on Center Stage, 2 o'clock Wednesday afternoons. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Welcome back to the final segment of today's Ehana Kako. I want to say thanks to Jay Fidel and the terrific crew that works at Think Tech Hawaii, as well as its many volunteers. Uh, they put out about 30 to 35 hours of original content produced here in downtown Honolulu, watched across the planet. And I want to say mahalo to them. It's a great source of information on current issues. You can get all the archives at thinktechhawaii.com. Now, my guest today has said some provocative things. And one of the things that has intrigued me most has been the fact that there are systems at work that we often know little about. We often ignore them. But we have to understand the whole system of the island in order to make good decisions about particular things, such as rail or such as cities and so forth. But uh, I've asked him a question going into our final segment. Panos, once again, if you did have a student who designed a project but and as an engineer, mm -hmm. but didn't have a power supply, what would you do to that student? How does this relate to the rail? Uh, well, it relates very much to it, and actually that's part of the reason why in my professional career I have moved a little bit away from transportation and into energy and power because I realized that, okay, I'm spending a lot of time in transportation, but transportation is useless if I don't have the juice to power it. And the juice can be anything, you know, from electricity to fuels to natural gas, that's et cetera, right. et cetera. Same thing with the train now. What happened with the train? I mean, I... KHON, Channel 2 News, and other uh, media sources made a big deal out of it, finally revealing that the rail doesn't have a power plant. Th now, now, let's stop here for a moment, okay, because this is hard to fathom. Right. Th th this, this massive project, this m major uh, com commitment of finances, the largest in the history of our state, was designed with everything in place, maybe mm -hmm. most things in place, mm -hmm. except the power system. How right. in the world do, do engineers do that? Or were the engineers the culprits here? Um, no, it, it was a, a planning and political decision to uh, essentially uh, play dumb. Uh, they pretended, because it's an electric train, they pretended that the system is like uh, you or I buying an electric vehicle. Uh, we don't have to apply for permits. We don't need substations or anything. We go home, we plug it, we're good to go. So they said, OK, we're building an electric train. Then we have an electric utility. They'll provide the juice. We're all good. So there was a huge assumption there That's a huge that, assumption. that the, the, the public didn't question enough. That's right. Uh, and perhaps, as you suggest, because politicians wanted to hide that question from the public. Exactly, because it's a $150 million question. It's kind of like when I want to buy this SUV vehicle and so forth, and then I ask the salesperson, what's the cost of the gas? Mm -hmm. How am I going to fuel this thing? Will that add to the price? Uh, the only reason he wouldn't tell me, I think, is if he didn't want me to be aware that it would cost more. That's right. So uh, that's exactly the objective, to not reveal uh, the, that part of the cost, because Panos, it was high. I'm hearing this now, after mm -hmm. the news reports and after you have publicized mm -hmm. this and commented on well, it. Well, I publicized in 2008, yes, but there was you, no power plan. You were w yeah. the lone voice back right. then. But I sit here, shaking my head, asking, yeah. How does this kind of thing happen? Yeah, that's right. Uh, again, by design, that's, uh, you know, it's the, what's the expression? Hoodwinked? <laughs> <I mean> <laughs> that's exactly, it was a sales job with, uh, you know, only the good features and none of the bad features, particularly when it came to costs. Now, uh, when we're talking about the, the admitted cost overruns from Hart, uh -huh. they never so far have admitted a cost, I think a few weeks ago. Uh, Brian Morioka talked about $150 million for the utility contribution that they have to make. Uh, because the system requires significant substations and uh, the, the issue of power generation actually it is still lying with uh, HECO or HECO Nextera or what happens. But uh, 
Yes, it's, it's a significant source of uh, concern. Now, this leads us to another question. There, there are lots of energy power issues that we're facing now. Mm -hmm. And our state government has announced, our governor, that we should have a 100% renewable energy mandate for the, right. the grid. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Will that, be, will that save us for the, <laughs> the rail, or is that e well, even realistic? Uh, it, it is completely unrealistic because, uh, again, it's a case of uh, politics jumping over uh, reality. Uh, in theory, you could do it if uh, cost is not an issue. But this is, you know, public service. Uh, we're supposed to care about public health and safety. In other words, you cannot install a system that is inherently unreliable. Well, l let me Hospitals will not be able to work. Escalators and elevators will stop working at the hotel. So you cannot do, let's say, 100% wind. It's impossible. So pragmatically, you're Pragma saying it just exactly. won't work. Exactly. In terms of uh, being able to achieve it within the next 15 to 20 years, do you think we could even achieve no, we the goal achieve. of 100% renewables? No. It, it makes assumptions that they're really quite unrealistic, and they have co cost implications. In a place where our cost already is three times uh, U.S. average, you know, now, higher than U.S. average. It boggles the mind. So they're, they're going in the upper direction instead of in the lower direction. Now, Panos, you know, one of the most sacred cows mm -hmm. in, in just public discourse today is, mm -hmm. is the promotion of a more sustainable future, right. which means renewables and so forth, right. which means getting rid of the evil fossil fuels mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Are you against renewable energy? <laughs> Um, <laughs> renewable I'm energy. I'm asking rhetorically. Well, obviously not. Uh, I, I was one of the early adopters mm -hmm. of uh, solar panels on my house, and I enjoy them. They work. Um, I don't promote them, but I think it was a good idea, and it still is a good idea for Hawaii. I totally dislike Hiko's plan to create uh, big solar farms on essentially prime Hawaiian land. Any land in Hawaii is precious. Why are you covering it with panels? when you have all these roofs that they are underutilized. Because the rail doesn't cover enough of it. <laughs> right. Uh, so every time that you look the obvious and politicians and special interests make the wrong decision, the answer is the same. Follow the money. Somebody's bribed, somebody's making money, while if you follow the citizen path, it would have been a better plan for Hawaii. So solar can work. We can multiply our rooftop exposure. Uh, Wind, I'm not going to talk a big story about wind because thankfully people don't like it. I mean, remember even Mufi tried to put uh, uh, windmills on top of the Waianae range and he got clobbered. So job done. I didn't have to say too much about it. So let, let the Saches and the Blue Planet Foundations and whatever uh, preach things that people don't want. They're not going to go anywhere with it because there's so much you can really screw the public. Now, a lot of times people argue that Renewable energy sources such as solar so, and even wind to some extent can, can make houses self-sufficient. We've got sure. a few models and so forth. Right. And then they say, well, why not just do that across the grid? Why not just do that across the island? Uh, what what do you say to that? Well, because then, you know, if the 10% who is able to pay the bills get off the grid, guess what you and I have to do? Pay twice as much for the grid. What kind of social policy is that? Again, the rich guys get off with their batteries and their panels, and the 90% of the population, pardon the expression, gets screwed because the grid has to survive. Look at all the HECO crews working all over the place, trying to repair it and keep it. Who's going to pay their salary? This is basic infrastructure. That's why we have huge problems with our water supply, sewer supply, and electricity grid. Nobody does the math from A to Z and everything that is involved. They select a little nice little piece that looks green or fancy, and they focus on that. But that's not a way to run an infrastructure for a million mm. population. They talk about, you know, the independence of Lanai in terms of energy. Who cares? I can have a thousand independent Greek islands. They have a thousand people or less. You cannot scale that for 1.1 million people. So again, again public self and health and safety. I mean, I, I cannot stand these politicians that they are talking things that they don't know what they're talking about. We have to they're dangerous. We have to see the entire system That's right. work. Well, I appreciate that this more system, systemic understanding of 
how the island works, how the city works, That's and right. so forth. Uh, we've got to go in just a few moments. Sure. But I, I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on s some of the projects that have been brought to a standstill and a halt in Hawaii from mm. the 30 meter telescope, before that, the super ferry, and so forth. And the super ferry was, uh, in my heart, one of the biggest, biggest losses for Hawaii. Mm. It had a reasonable business plan. Uh, it had an uh, opportunity to make it, and they, they had a plan for the long term. It provides a real alternative. It provided a, a special way, particularly for disaster relief, if one of the outer islands, or our island here, uh, Oahu, got a direct hit from a storm. All kinds of excellent uses that actually would have made it worthwhile for a small subsidy too. I'm not a subsidy, thing, but, but if it needed a little more subsidy, instead they did the opposite. It they must went be, and killed it. It must be something very good because even Panos is saying he'd be okay with the government with subsidy, a little subsidy for that yes. little push. Because, you know, uh -huh. uh, you have to pay for the resilience. I cannot ask your company That's to provide right. resilience for my household. So if I provide you resilience, you have to give me something for the extra capacity that I'm giving you in case of need. You spoke earlier about our mindset. Mm -hmm. in the, the state of Hawaii. Would, would you say that there's something similar in mindset to the stopping of the ferry as well as the TMT? The, the TMT, uh, it's, it's a similar thing. I think it was a big blow to, mm -hmm. to, to science. Uh, I was disappointed to see that. I understand what the folks are saying, but you know, I think again, it's one of the biggest gifts that Hawaii has to give to the world. The, 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 the culture could have nicely married with science and make it a win-win, not an animosity and protector and all that stuff that uh, developed. Now that we've virtually lost the 30-meter telescope, and we've already clearly lost the, the super ferry, and we've had the closure of, of a recent, uh, the, the last uh, of the, the, the uh, sugarcane mm -hmm. plantations, how does Hawaii look as an investment climate for future capital in your mind? Uh, probably the worst. The only, the only thing that, has, uh, that we have going, and it actually uh, works very bad for us, is that we're becoming uh, the real estate banking for the world. Mm. Basically, the rumor I heard, and I, don't, I know it's a fact, it's not a rumor, is that Chinese, Russians, and all kinds of international friends or foes put their million dollars in Hawaii in, or more in real estate, and they have in the, for, for a foreigner that, you know, they, they have no reliable country and system. So we're an offshore bank, a, exactly. a, a colony for them. Exactly, really. where a real estate came on islands. Now, will this money that comes into high-end real estate investment here result in the jobs, the industry, the infrastructure Very temporary, that unfortunately, very temporary. It, it creates a spike that we cannot sustain. And then, you know, unfortunately, our real estate uh, taxation uh, based on the scheme with the GT and everything else, our real estate taxes are low, so we're not really catching those mm. people and drawing a lot of money out. It's a win-win for them, not for us. One minute left. Sure. What does the city and county of Honolulu need above all else now? Focus, focus and priorities, because we're running out of money and we have to do the right things. And one of the things that we can do quickly is shrink the rail. Let's make sure that the darn thing doesn't go to 10 billion. It's 10 billion of complete loss. 10 billion or at least a few billion that could have been used for something else. For electricity upgrades, for sewer upgrades, for water upgrades, for road upgrades. Not for that system that is, it's, you know, it's, it's the gift that keeps on taking and is not giving anything. Mm. So we got to essentially cut it short. Middle Street to Kapolei, put it to bed. Panos Hack, appreciate your you expertise. Bet and your passion. You bet. Thanks for being here today. My, My guest today has been Panos Provaduras, Chairman and Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Hawaii. But more than that, a public, a public intellectual whose challenges to mainstream thinking need to be heard. I'm Kili'i Akina, President of the Grassroot Institute. Until next time, on Ehana Kako will wish you aloha from the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. <laughs>